Ready? Everybody, good morning. Are you awake? Excellent. So today's topic is obviously only for China because we are talking about WeChat mini programs. You have been playing around with JavaScript for a little bit. So now you are ready to dig into this new environment. I say new environment because it's really unique. Tencent built it from scratch. So a little bit of background first. Mini programs have been announced in September 2016, last year. They've been announced at that time and they started to make a big, big noise in the industry. What is this thing? What is it about? Why Tencent is doing it? So there was a lot of press and a lot of hype about what could possibly mini programs be versus a regular official account. You know the two types, they are the services account and the subscription accounts in your WeChat app. So brands mostly and developers were wondering why and what can we do with it. The story is Tencent was a bit pissed by the behavior of the brands and the companies using services accounts, official accounts, not to do a service, but to just broadcast news. This is the way most brands have been using services accounts. They will use it to push you an article and expect you to read it, and they will use it for marketing only, and not to deliver any customer service. Very few we are actually doing it the right way. So Tencent decided to create a new environment and use all the APIs, all the functionalities they have already prepared for developers and create a new branch that they would call mini programs. Their objective? is to have more of your time, more of your brain, and keep you inside their app, clearly. They want to kill the app store. They don't want you to download more apps than WeChat. They want you to stay in WeChat constantly. They want you to have more functionalities within WeChat. That's more or less their end goal. So that was last September. Then starting December 2016, um, the first beta for developer was released. So at that time, we got access to the documentation. We got access to all the information we needed to start developing apps. So only developers were playing around with this framework. And in January of this year, they finally opened it for the public. At that time, every one of us would access a new tab, mini programs, inside WeChat. And we would start to see mini programs coming up. Now, when this happened, Immediately after February, we started to see bad press. We started to see very bad reviews of what is a mini program and saying that it's not going to work, it's going to be terrible. Reason being is these mini programs at that time had very, very few ways to be shared. Very, very few ways to create traffic to it. It was quite limited. The framework was limiting the way you could share your mini program to your friends or to your WeChat moments. Or, so obviously, you will spend a lot of time developing an app that nobody would be using. So brands starting to be a bit skeptical. That was in February. And then at that time, a lot of bad press. It was very early stage for the framework, which was released just a month before. And everybody starting to say, yeah, you know, it's been totally hyped and maybe it's just bad. Maybe. Now, moving on. We started to see it picking up by April or May. We started to see more and more mini programs coming with more and more interesting use cases. And eventually, we also saw their main competitor doing the same, creating an app framework within the app, classic. They empower developers to create functionalities and light applications inside Alipay. Now, that was yeah a couple of months ago. And now we start to see a, a new trend growing. We see plenty of entrepreneurs launching mini programs that are quite smart and using the opportunities, obviously being the, the first movers, just like the App Store for iOS 10 years ago. When you were the first one to create an app, you would obviously have a lot of traffic to it. So from, I say, April to now, there was a big rush into being the first to launch apps. At the same time, we started to see brands being more and more interested. And when brands are interested, they look for developers. And guess what? There are very few developers in this planet able to do this. 
it's quite it's so unique that it's hard to find somebody able to do it. Now, walking around with all these people, agencies, brands, developers that I know, we started to think about how relevant it is for you guys. And it's actually very, very relevant for you guys to know it fast. Because A, if you're an entrepreneur, there are plenty of opportunities. B, if you want to become a developer, there are plenty of clients looking for you, or plenty of brands trying to hire you. Um, some experts, and I'm quoting here the CEO of Wikai Labs, some experts say that mini programs can do 80% of what native apps can do. So if you were developing on iOS or Android, you can do a lot of functionalities, right? Many programs at this stage, with the framework given by Tencent, can do at least 80% of what the apps can do, but it requires only 20% of the efforts. You can do it very fast. You can develop an app very, very fast. And indeed, in order to build this course and give to you some resources, I, I built an app. When I was April, in between two batches, I started to build an app. And it took me just 48 hours to get it done, to understand the framework and then release something. An app can be built in 48 hours, depending on the complexity. So it's really fast to produce something. Again, remember, it's only for China, and it's only inside WeChat, which means 900 million active users potential for your app. Okay? So that even if you are within a closed environment, you have 900 million target users. It's not some, that's not something small. So that was just to give you a bit of the environment. The app that I'm using myself every single day, the mini program I've been using every single day is, is mobile. Every morning, I scan with WeChat, boom, I'm inside the light app, it's instant, it's an instant app. I use mobile and I quit it. I don't use it anymore until the day after. I don't know about you guys, maybe you have plenty of mini programs. And what I will do after this course, I will include you in a group of nerds that are sharing mini programs all day long. As soon as they find one that is interesting, they share it, and all these, all these people are actually developing mini programs. This way you can know more about this, this industry that is actually growing. Okay? So that was the overall overview of the market. Got it? So today we spend some time understanding how the framework works, and then I will give you an assignment so that you can make your own. Cool? OK. Um, this is done. And the basics first. Well, the first thing you have to know is when you want to develop a mini program, you have to register a new mini program on Tencent platform. And this is not for everybody. There are a lot of manuals on how to do it, step-by-step -step tutorial in English. It's quite easy to do. The thing is, in order to do a new, to create a new mini program, you have to be Chinese. That's the, that's the truth. You have to go through, you, you select application inside the platform, you register for it, and then you need a Chinese identity card. And this person will be the owner of your app. There's no way around it. This person will be scanning every single QR code throughout the process of development, of publishing, of management. This person will be the owner of your mini program. So you need a Chinese friend if you want to do it. Or you need a Chinese identity card, lucky you. So that's, that's the way it is. So you have to register the app. Tencent will validate it, will give you what we call an app ID. They will give you a unique ID saying, this is your app. And then you will have to certify the mini program, giving a bit more information about what do you want to do with it. And as soon as you get the certification, only then you'll be able to start publishing your app inside WeChat. Before this, you can always develop it, but you need a, some sort of certification, some sort of review from Tencent in order to publish it. Plenty of information to provide. So there are, there are a lot of tutorials. And in order to do today's course, we have obviously registered an app um, that is called Le Wagon Alpha. And this is our playground. So last night, I've shared access to all of you. And now you are developers on this app. Each of you, your WeChat personal account, has now access to this mini program. And I will show you how you can access to everything. So now you guys have been, are listed here. 
as developers of this mini program. And I share to you the app ID that we'll be using in order to develop it. So that was the prep work from last time. I accept my notification and download the working environment. Now, here, the first thing that you get access to once you register a mini program is this kind of dashboard. This is the dashboard you, 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 you will be using to give access to your teammates, to review the code that your team have pushed. And you have three steps. You'll be able to see the code that is on staging, the one that you finished and you want to publish, the code that is pending review from Tencent, and the code that is deployed public. So you will have to use this management dashboard in order to publish everything you want. And then to do the settings, and then to configure the payments, and then to manage the statistics, and all the, the information of your app. For example, the QR code that you want to use in order to download it, and all the APIs that you want to connect to, that will be through this dashboard. I shared to you last night on this prep work um, a little PDF here that gives you a translation, English and Chinese, of each functionality of the dashboard. So this way, I make sure you'll be able to play with it later. As of today, you won't need this dashboard. We will focus on the development part. But you have to know that everything goes through this dashboard in order to publish your app. OK? That's quite classic. Every single official account, subscription account, have a dashboard like this to manipulate the content. Now, what we need is this WeChat IDE. IDE means Integrated Development Environment. It's basically a software that Tencent is giving you in order to develop. You can still use Sublime Text if you want to edit your code, but you'll be using this IDE in order to preview, to simulate your app on your desktop. You will be using it in order to scan a QR code and see and preview it in your phone also. So this ID is very powerful. It's pretty much your console. It is your Chrome. It is your Sublime Text. It is your GitHub. It's all, all combined. And that's very simple to use. So you have to download it. And we made a small, small tutorial here to give you a highlight of what are the different parts of works. So all of you should have access to it already. And I will show you how to make your first app, OK? So the idea looks, this, looks like this. And this is the app I was building on in April. Very small mini program that enables any company in China to send you guys some job offers. So they can send a small brief. This page will open. They will describe their need and send a job offer. And this will go straight to a database that you will have access to. And then another tab that is purely content and information about what we do. So that was a very simple mini program. And we see on the left that I'm simulating it. And on the right, I have the source code. I'm able to debug it. I'm able to upload it to Tencent. I'm able to preview it in my phone. And I have way more than this. I've got a few apps that I already built. So normally, once you have access to this IDE, your first step would be to, let me quit this guy. Your first step would be to say, you have to scan the QR code to log in. Normally, when you open the IDE, you have to log in with your phone. And then you can say, I want to develop a WeChat mini program, the first option here. Then you will have to create a new mini program. You will press the plus button for a new mini program. And of course, first step, asking you for what app ID. Which one do you want to, de to, to develop? And this is the app ID that I sent to you this morning. So I will do it with you in a, in a second. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. This is the right time. So let's jump into it. I will, I, I'm not going to log in and log out because my phone is busy at the moment. But I'm going to create a new project. And in here, I would send the app ID that I want to use. This is the app ID of the alpha account, the one we use for development. So I will use this app ID in here and send it to this field. Then I will say it's a, it's a test project. This is the name of the project on my machine, on my computer. You can name it the way you want. And this last field is telling me where do you want to store your project, where, which, which folder do you want to save all your code? 
you can obviously put it anywhere you want, as long as you know where to find it. This is just for the course. I will select this folder, see it on my desktop, and by default, the ID is telling you, okay, I see that this project is empty, there's nothing in your folder, so do you want to, to quick start? Do you want me to fill it with some code? And I will say, yes, I'm happy to quick start and get access to some basic source code that we'll be able to play with. Then the app is created, see its name, test project. This is the Levango Alpha picture that I've said before, and this is the app ID that I'm using. It's saved on my desktop, and I'm ready to use the first app here in order to preview it. And it comes immediately with some basic code that we'll be playing with. And it comes immediately with some functionalities. Already detects my name and saying hello. So that would be a very simple and nice to use playground. That would be your starting point for most of you. Now, this is really important. The structure of this app. We spend a little bit of time to explain who is doing what, because as soon as you quick start with this IDE, you get access to some files named app, and then some pages. I'm guessing this ring a bell a little bit. Remember the app.js? This is quite familiar in all frameworks. And then we have more folders with more pages. We have an app.js, which is really important. You have an app.json, that you will use a lot for the settings of your app. This is where you will store some settings, the, the style of your app, the tabs of your app, and the pages of your app. We will set them here. That's kind of your router. If you remember the OV, this is your router. And this guy is your style sheet. It, it doesn't look like CSS, and I will explain it for in, in a moment, but this is your main style sheet. This file, app, Weishin SS, and not CSS, this Weishin SS is your style sheet. Okay? And then we have a pages folder that contains two pages, an index page and a log page, that have pretty much the same structure inside. An index.js, a JSON file, a markup file, Weishin ML, and not HTML, Weishin ML, and again, a style sheet, index.weishinSS. OK? Markup, design, settings, all functionalities, all the logic is here. JS, JavaScript. OK? So this is what is given to you. So we, we start with these ones, because they are really the, the, the key ones to start with. And then we'll be able to play with each of the pages, because they render one after another. OK? So this framework is giving to you a lot of things for free. There are a lot of things that is happening on these apps that you don't have to take care about compared to other frameworks. Example, the settings that are here. I told you the JSON file, as the name suggests, it's a JSON. So we get this object. Everybody's familiar with this structure already. It's an object that contains two properties, pages and window. And everyone has an array inside. This one has an array of pages. One page, two pages. This is where I can create new pages for my app. Right now, I've got two pages in two folders. So I could create a new page that I would call new, because I like inspiration right now. Save my file, command S. And immediately, a new folder was built for me. A new page has been added to the pages folder and contains exactly the same sort of files. They come together. So this would be your roots. These are the pages available within your app, and you can make as many as you want. As soon as you add them inside this array, your app will know that these are the pages I can navigate to. It will make your own roots. This setting window will help me to design a little bit what is the background of my app, for example, a light gray. It's actually, sorry, the navigation bar on this one. Navigation bar background color, this one. 
And then I can change the title that is here and the color. So now I've already set the navbar that is here. That's just one. This is the window. In a minute, I will show you a bit more. So these are the main settings of your app. The main colors, the main tab bar, the main navigation bar, and the main routes. OK? So routing, window, tab bar, and a bit more. We'll see in a second. Do you have a tab bar to give you? Mm, yeah. One thing you have to know, to help you guys, we spend quite a lot of time working on this wiki. It is not an official documentation. This is our own analysis of what's, what is the framework, and we give you a lot of tips. So there are plenty of contributors. We'll meet uh, Nathan next week. Um, Adrian is one of the alumni, and they worked on this wiki to save you a lot of time. So if you want to set up your mini program and create a tab bar, you can go here and grab this tab bar. This tab bar would go inside the app.json file, for example. So this wiki, you have access to it. It is on GitHub. And it is in the course. So let's say I want to add a tab bar. I will add a new section in here, app.json, tab bar. And it comes with a lot of information, including a list. This list is itself an array. And I can say where I want it to be. So I don't want an icon for this one. I don't have icons in my project. I will remove these guys, remove the icons, but I want to keep the text. And I have a link to index. I will create index. And I have a link to, I will make a link to the new page. This way I'll be able to play with my new page. This is my new page. So if I, if I didn't do any mistakes in my object, as soon as I save, the app is recompiling immediately. And now my tabs have appeared. You see it at the bottom. Now I have an index on the, on the left side and new on the right side. I can click on new, and my page is loading new. Now I've got access to the new page. Index is back here. So now I've just built a tab bar. With a few settings, a few more options like these ones that are given to you by the framework. I mean, you can't invent things here. You have to use what, what Tencent is giving you. I could create as many tabs as I want. I think it's limited to five, though. And then you can, I can also put it at the top if I want it. You can always do some settings like this. So if you want more information about how to use the tab bar, we've done this quite comprehensive breakthrough of every option possible. And be careful to send it the right information. Sometimes you need a string. Sometimes you need a color. Sometimes you need an array, depending on what is the option. Right? In this case, I need a color. In this case, I need an array. It depends on uh, what is the property that you want to send to it. All right, so that's that's the main setting file, the app.json file. Cool for everybody? Any questions in here? Cool. So moving on. Let's have a look at what we call the life cycle. When your app is opening in your phone, there are plenty of different functions that are going to be launched one after another. And we call it a life cycle. The first function that is initialized by your app is called on launch. And then another one is called on show, right after another. The app is launching, and then we show the content. Once the app is loaded, each page will be loaded. We, we will unload the page, and then we will show a page. And all these functions, there are JavaScript functions, will be done one after another. This is what we call the life cycle. It's like a chain, and they will be all next to each other. So when you hit a tab, you'll be showing it. And when I hide the tab, I go to the next tab, I will be hiding the page. I will unhide, unshow, unhide, unshow. Whenever I load it first, I will go this way. I will load the page, show the page, show the content, and then the unready is, is given to me. I can do anything I want when the page is ready. If you remember with jQuery, it's pretty much the same than when document is ready. It's a little bit the same. 
and I can also load a function that is called on unload whenever I reload the entire app. The page would be unloaded. So in order to show you this full life cycle, I will use a good old console log. And this way we can see them one after another. So I've got an on launch here, which is on the app. This is the app.js file. So I could add a console log, and I will write inside app is launched. Now, I told you that the app.js file have the on launch and also have on show. This is another function that is available. So I could add another function right after and say on show. Close this one. This one, I cannot make it bigger, unfortunately. Uh, hold on. No, I cannot. I cannot modify the side of this uh, crew. So I have an on show here, and I will be able to control log app is shown. So now these two functions will be executed one after another. And we should see two logs, one after another. So when I go in my debug mode here, you guys recognize these things? Exactly like when you were in, in, in Chrome. I have access to a console. I have access to the source code. I have access to the network. Some local storage. The markup. And in particular, I want the console here. So when I reload, just like refresh, I reload my app, I get two different logs that I did, app is launch, app is shown. These are the first two. Now, you see at the, at the right, it's written app.js, app.js, so we will see that this was logged from the app.js file. And suddenly after, I get onload. I didn't write it, it's part of the quick start, actually. It's part of the quick start project. Onload is, is logged, and it comes from the index file. So this one, this index file, was actually loaded right after the app. First we load the app, and then we load all the pages. In this case, the index page. Let me show you the code of the index page. I go inside the index.js, and you, you see right here, there is the same onload function, and they have already logged inside onload. So I would say index page is loaded. And I would be a little bit more specific. I will log inside some day dot now so that we can have a little timestamp and check that each of them is actually one after another, right? So I've got to console log day dot now and index page is loaded. I will do exactly the same for you guys in the new page that is called new. And by default comes with, you see, this one was that was generated by the framework is given to me with a big page function here that comes with on load, on ready, on show, on hide, etc., etc. So this is my new page, and I will log different things, the dead dot now, and I will also log some simple string saying new page is loaded. Then on ready, new page is ready. On show, new page is shown, I guess. And on hide, that would be also useful. New page is hidden. So now we'll be able to see the process. We'll be able to see the life cycle from the app to the pages. So let me show you here. I will load my app. My app is loaded. And then you see the loading bar that the index page has been loaded. And there is a timestamp on when the index page was loaded. And now it's written index page is loaded. Now I want to see the logs of my, of my new page. So I will click on the new tab. When I click on the new tab, I'm going to load the new tab, right? I'm going to load the new page. So I will click new. And immediately my page is loaded. And everything comes together. The page is loaded. The page has been shown. And my page is ready. It's ready to do anything you want. We have to wait for the page to be ready. We have to wait for the markup to be here in order to start 
manipulating this markup, to start interacting with this markup. So now the page is ready, and I, if I wanted, I could do some code here. I could start manipulating it. What happens with the shown and hidden? Remember, I've got on hide. That would be when I hide it. So if I go back to the index, new is going to be hidden, new page is hidden, and the index, pa index page is shown. So I could always go back and forth, shown, hidden, shown, hidden. And you see that every time, one of these functions is going to be called show, hide, show, hide. So all of them are working right after each other. And you can write your functionalities according to which part of the life cycle do you want to play with. Do you want to load data when the page is loading? Do you want to show an alert when you hide the page? Do you want to start manipulating the data when the page is ready? You have to think about which part of the life cycle you want to play with. Okay, so all of these are given to you by the framework. That was just um, an introduction about this part. Does it make sense? There's more coming. Any questions? So app first, and then each page individually. Remember to console log when you're a bit uh, stuck in which function should I use. You can do it. Now, pages. We will start to make some markup, and we start to in interact with these pages. First, we will create a static page. And we did it already. It's new, the new page. I will put some markup inside. And second, I will make it dynamic. I want this page to change and load data inside. So I want it to be dynamic. OK? Now, Weixin decided not to use HTML. They call it Weixin ML. It's actually uh, smart because it gives you a lot of components for free. They created a lot of components, just like React, so that we can have a lot of functionalities already packaged. HTML is very dumb. It's just a market. Weishin ML has a lot more. So in order to write your pages, in order to design your pages, you have to know the basics of Weishin ML. They are very, very basic ones. Instead of a div, they call it a view. Don't ask me why. They just call it a view. Um, so for example, if you want to make a header or make a container, you will have view class, the good old class, no problem, header, and then you could your content, sorry, and then you, you close it with view. That's all. It's like a divider, but they could it view instead. That's a very, very useful one. You will use it constantly. This is your divider. Next, they didn't want to create an anchor, they called it a navigator. But it works the same way. Navigator with a URL. Where do you want to go to? So instead of a href, you will do navigator URL. And which page you want to go to. That's all. So it's, this is the second type. The ing tag, they call it image. OK? Well, that's easy to remember. The p tag, they call it text. And finally, the block is something that is a bit unique. And I'll show you a bit later. This is a wrapper. It's a wrapper component that we'll be able to replicate. I'm not sure you will use blocks very often, because views can do pretty much the same. But uh, it takes a lot of um, new properties, too. OK? So I will start writing some, um, I will start writing some markup in here. This is my new page. So I go inside my pages folder, new Weishin ML, OK? And they give me this very ugly text component. Remember, it's like a P. So it's shown right here. Instead of this guy that I will delete, I will write what we call a view, which is a divider. And there is autocomplete on this ID. So first, it's telling me what, what kind of view do you want. There are more specific ones. You can do a scroll view, a picker view, whatever. And I can say I want a regular view. I, I press tab, and it's autocompleted for me, just like Sublime Text. You tap the name of the element, and the rest is given to you. So here, view, class, last name. You know what? I will call it container. The good old container. I know you missed it. So I've got my first element that will be my container. And inside this container, I will write a text, which is, remember, like a P. 
and I will say welcome aboard. So let's have a look at the new page. Welcome aboard is right here. Nobody is noticing something. How come this text is centered? Why is it right here? Why is the padding all around? Well, I have a container class. And this container class, where is it? It's not in here. There's no styling in this page, it's empty. So where is it coming from? From the app, exactly. This is the main style sheet. By default, contains already some CSS code. At least it gives me what one thing, a container. So this class container, being in the app version file, is now available for the entire app. I can call it from this page. I can call it from this page. Actually, they did it here. They call the container class in the in the index page by default. So any class CSS that is in the app version, I can use it anywhere I want. That's why I was already using container, and by default, it's centered and done. A little sidetrack here. Do you remember this one? It's a flexbox. So of course, yes, these frameworks can work very well with Flexbox. You want your app to be responsive. And you want to use Flexbox as often as you can. So getting back to the markup, I have access to Welcome Aboard. I could create another view that I will make a class, I don't know, H1. That's something important to understand. This is a big title. I will load my page. and. Here we go. Go to the new page. I want to style this H1. Unfortunately, this sort of tags do not exist. You have only access to text, to view, and to block. So if I want to do an H1 in my page, I will have to create a class H1, H2, H3, you name it. And then I'm able to say, OK, create a new H1 class, and that's pure CSS code. There's nothing fancy in here. And then, see, you have access to every single thing. I type font, autocomplete. I want a font size, and I will give it a 40 pixel. So now, my H1, obviously, will be bigger. In my new page, I've got a big title. Clear for everybody? This is a P. This is just a a divider with a class on it. I'm pretty sure you can also send a class to a text. I'm pretty sure. Not, not entirely, though. This is most often what they do. Um, so this is the basic, basic way you write markup. So every page will get this sort of, remember the DOM? It's the same thing. Here we have a DOM. We have views, images, and texts. Ah, see, yeah, texts have classes too. No problem. Now, let's move on, unless you have questions at this part. Easy? All right. Data binding, that's very important. Because as of now, my page is static. This one has text written in it. But what if I want to make it dynamic? What if I want this title to change and I want to load load of content in there. I don't want to obviously write my text myself. I want to load it from somewhere, from my databases, for example, on my local storage. So I have to make it dynamic. And in order to update this view, we do not have many, many ways. We have to do what we call data binding. In the Weishin environment, there is no DOM. We cannot select an element in the page like we used to do with jQuery or the DOM document selector and say select you and then add a listener and update the content. This is not going to happen this way. It's not exactly the same way. In order to control your page, you have to use what we call data binding. We are going to connect the markup with the JS page. We are going to connect them and make what this is what we call the view layer. The view, remember the view? In the OP, this is the view. And this is your logical layer. They come together. The markup file contains the view, the text, and everything. 
and the JS file contains your data. So the first thing that you will notice in every page you have is this guy. At the top, there is a data object, the first one. Every time in each page, you have a data object. This is where you will be able to put your data. This is where you will inject your data from your API or your database. And this is where you will be able to make some, um, some dynamism. In this part, this is my markup. And if I want this guy to become dynamic, this is a big title. I will send it to the logical layer, the data object that is at the top. I will call this guy header, for example. Add it a string. This is a big title. So everybody should be familiar with this structure. This is a JavaScript object. And I will write another one that we call text. This is a text. I have a header. I have a text. There are strings. And now that I have this data object in my logical layer, I will be able to inject it in the markup. How can I inject content? I have to use this syntax that we call mustache. This is a mustache syntax. And I can say, I want to inject the header. This header refers to this guy. I'm going inside the data object, and I call the header. I can do the same with the text. I can inject in here the text I want. And now that I have this variable name, it's actually the property from this data object. This string of text will be injected inside the market. So we will have the same result. But you will see that the data is now in the logical layer, in the JavaScript file, not in the markup itself. The markup is dynamic. So if I reload my logical layer, my text in my page will change. OK? Now, that was just the simple mustache syntax loading a text, right? From the data object, I can load the text, no problem. What if I want to load a bit more than that? What if I want to have a more structured object than just a string? I can, of course, include also an array. I can include anything I want in this data object. So what if I want to have something I will call stories, and I will create an array, remember the array, that contains different objects inside, classic structure. One, two, three. I need to close this guy. Inside, I will be able to have a first story. I will do it in different languages. Another story. A set story. So what do we have in here? These stories is an array. You see the brackets? That contains one, two, three objects. So how can I access now this data? How can I show it in my view? I think you have it in the slides. We can, of course, inject a text and say that we want, we have to write these curly braces again and again. I want to call the stories. This is an array. I want to go inside the array. There is only one object inside. I want to go inside. So I can say index 0. Now I'm inside the array. And how can I get access to any of them? Actually, they are the same name right now. Dot story. Dot story. Here we go. So this will give me the first story of my stories array. Stories array has three objects, one, two, three. So I get access to the first one. And then I can immediately write Nihal this way. If I was on the number two, on number one, 
I will get to different text. And we get bonjour instead. So I show you again the array. Index zero, index one, index two, dot story, dot story, dot story. Okay for everybody? Stop me if something is unclear. I really need all of you to understand this because that's how you will be listing content, of course. And that's my next part. Clear for everybody? Sure? Cool. Now that I have an array, I will be able to start looping through this array, iterating through this array. I remember, I know that you missed it a little bit. So let's have a look. There is this speci specific control property called waiting for. This property is sent directly to the view layer. I'm inside my waiting file, my waiting ML file, and I can use waiting for and say that I want to loop on one specific array. So view waiting for array will basically repeat this block over and over. I will get access to each item individually, each story in my case here. So I will be able to do, and I will do it right now, I will be able to say in my markup file, I want you to write different stories. So view, give me for all the stories it's like for all or for each, remember in Ruby, this is an each basically. For each stories, give me a new view, show me the index number, and tell me the story. Item is given to you by the waiting for. Index is also given to you. Index would be 0, 1, 2, 3. And item is the way I can then access the story that is inside stories. I remove this guy not to confuse you. So now I'm going to basically loop through the stories array. I reload my page, I save my code. And in the new, now I have zero nihal, one bonjour, two hello. Yeah? Thanks to this guy. I'm doing waiting for stories, index zero, index one, index two, item.story, item.story, item.story. This is the way in for. So that's pretty much the way you will be listing your cards, listing your cities, listing your functionalities, anything that you want to display on your page. You will have an array, an object in your logical layer, the, J the JavaScript file, and you will do a for. You will do a for loop on it. And they will all show in the page. Questions? I could be able to say I want each of them to have a unique ID. This way I can select them later or do something with it. And I could inside this ID give it the index directly. This way I will display the story in here. This is my content. And each story will get a unique ID. Let's have a look. Works the same. In the new, I have one, two, three, perfect. And if I go to inspect my code, this is the debugger here. I can get the console and I can inspect the code just like you used to inspect. I will inspect my code. And you see on the right side, I've got access to the DOM here. I can see, okay, view ID zero, view ID one, view ID two, Nihal, bonjour, hello. Cool for everybody. Great. No questions? All right. That's how you will be able to do some conditionals directly inside your markup if you want to. Of course, you can always write if else in your JavaScript file. But directly in your markup, you have the ability to connect with your data and say, for example, if the data length is more than five, then you show this guy. You can do an if, else, even else. You can make already conditionals in your markup using this property. Waiting if, waiting l if, and waiting else. It's not else if, it's l if. Okay? I'm not going to give you to, to put it in the code right now, but just know that it exists. And if you want to do it, you can render different views according to what is the data. 
You can always say if the, the length of the story is too long, then you don't share it. I don't know. Think about some use cases. Okay, conditional rendering. Okay, that's super important. Stay with me because this is how you will be able to bind information. We said it's uh, data binding and this is where the magic happens. That's how you will be able to click on a button and trigger an event. Just like where we used to have an event listener in our page and trigger some action. I don't know, Joe coding for example. Here, this is how we'll be able to do the same idea. I want my view layer to send an event. The Dragon says we want to fire an event to the logical layer. So we have access to these properties in the Weshin file, in the Weshin ML file. I have these properties that we call bind tap. It is not a click, it is a tap because we are on the phone, remember? So as long as somebody taps on this, in this case, this button, something will happen. I will be able to use bind tap to listen and wait for this tap on the button. So whenever somebody clicks this button, I want something to happen. Now, what can I make? I can here name a function. In this case, we call it add. And the add function will go look for your logical layer, your JavaScript file, and find a function that you have designed, that you have written yourself. So here we have an add function that will be fired as soon as I click on bind tap. So let me put it in my code and we will console log it in order to see it. I have a button. Yes, that's an element available in the framework of type primary. They are more or less the same than bootstrap. Success, primary, danger. Remember these, uh, these names? And then I'm adding a bind tap add. Instead of add, I will add it, I will name it increment. I name it the way I want. This is my function. I can decide the name I give to this function. This is part of the framework. This property exists in the framework. You cannot change it. But increment, this is my name, my function. Now that I have my button, my markup, I want something to happen. In particular, I think you see it. I want to increment this count. I want this count to become from, to go from zero to one to two to three every time I press this button. So let's go in my markup in the page here. I've got this button as of now. Count is undefined, there is zero, there is nothing. But I do have the button and when I click this button, I will want to fire an event every time. I want the increment function to be fired. So let's go in the logical layer. I don't have this function just yet, so I will design it. I say increment. This is the name of my function. Increment. Increment. I think it's good. Function. Comes with an event. This parameter is in here. And then I don't I want to remember to have, add a little comma in here. One after another. This one, this one, this one. They are chained with a comma in between, you see? So now I have access to my increment function. And I could console log to make sure that I do have indeed tapped my button. So let's have a look. I go in my new page. I check the console. This is the debugging, remember? I go in the console. And every time I, I type this button, I've got tapped that is logged right here. Cool for everybody? So that means that I received it in the new.js in the logical layer. I click and the increment function is fired with an event. Let's have a look what is inside this event. Let's log it and check a little bit what the framework is giving us. So I go in my new page, my new page is loaded, and then I can click increment button again. And as soon as I click, I'm logging the event. The event is what? It's an object that contains loads of stuff. It's telling me, okay, man, you have tapped a button. And let's look into the detail. The button was at this position. And what is the target? The target has this ID, which is right now null. It's undefined. So I could say, let's add an ID in this guy. 
I will name it um, increment button. Should go in here, I think. And I'll do it again. I go in the new page. I press my button. My object is tapped. And I go in the detail. No, in the target, sorry. And now I've got the ID increment button here. So I know that I typed the right button. Using the ID, I know that I typed this guy. OK? So my function works. Any question this way? This is a classic even binding here. Are you fine with this? Sweet. Now, the next part is to increment this count. So in order to increment it, I have to set it first. I will set a count of 0 in this case. In my data object at the top, count 0. So now my page will show me 0, no problem. And I will want to update this 0 to 1, to 2, to 3, to 4. For this, we have to use a built-in function that is called setData. This is given to you by the framework. So I will use this code. And as soon as I click the increment button, I will fire this event. And I will use this. This is who? This is this page. And I refer to this data here. This refers to this page. This page set data. This is a function. Set data what? I want the count. And I could set it to something different, of course. I could set it static to 2. But instead of setting from 0 to 2, what I want to do is to increment it plus 1. So I get this data. This is the page. Dot data. Dot count. So that would be 0 in this case, plus 1. And every time I click increment, I will set again the data, grab the previous value, plus 1, and send it back to count, which will go in here. This set data is a very important function. You will use it every single time. You want to modify this data object here to make it dynamic, right? So now, when I press my button again, I will be firing the increment function here. And the count will go from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6. And everything goes very fast. Clear? So I could, of course, console log in there. I could, I could debug inside each part and check what's happening. I wanted you to know this part. Because what if I want to increment a specific counter and not all the counters? What if I want to, to only change the counter of this story and not this story? I need to know which button did I click. Right now, this increment function is only on one button, which is quite easy. I know exactly where I go to. But what if I have this button several times in the page? Then I need to know which story I want to increment or which counter. If I have 10 counters in the page, I will need to know which one. So I need to know the, what is the event. And this event contains the ID of my button. So I know which button I clicked. So I know which story I want to increment. You will see it today in the exercise. That's why I'm giving you this hint. Use the event object that is here to know which part of your content did you click. If I want to increment on the Nira, I want to know that I clicked on Nira and not on Bonjour. And that's using the event here. That's for later. OK, so that was even handlers, conditional, for, and the data binding with the mustache syntax. Cool for everybody? Um, there are a bit more for even binding. This is the most important you have to know, the bind tab. But each type of uh, element contains its own events uh, handlers. So for example, a form gets access to bind submit and I could I could do a I could fire an event when I submit the form. There is a bind scroll that is available on a, on a specific view named scroll view. So when I scroll this view I can send some events the same way. 
Um, and there is bind input also on input buttons. So when I type something in the input, I can fire an event the same way. Bind tap, bind submit, bind input or bind score, they work the same way. They just have a different name. But they work exactly the same way. You can always, inside, assign a function that you want to fire from your logical layer. OK? Bind type is the one that uh, I wanted to remember. Um, and I won't go into these details, but there is bind, and there is also something that we call catch. It is slightly different. does not matter for you at this stage. It may matter if you have a more structured app, and then we can discuss it. Bind, 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 OK? This is the most difficult and the most important part of this lecture. Are you clear? Any questions? So we have, as a recap, we have a view layer. The view layer is your markup. It is your HTML page. And of course, we want it to be dynamic. We want to render markup. We want to create markup. So in order to render markup, we have to do binding with the logical layer. The logical layer is this JavaScript file that contains, by default, some functions on ready, on show, blah, 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 blah. You can create your own functions. And then you can manipulate the data of your page. This data object contains everything that you need. So this is the page that will hold all the logic. This guy is only the design of your page. This is what you have to remember right now. Plus, we can use bind tap in order to connect these two and send some information from the view layer to the logical layer and back and forth. This is how to set back data in the data object which will automatically render the page again and show you the new count. It comes two ways. I can send data from my view to my logical layer with an event, and I can send information from my data to my view using the mustache syntax. OK? They are, they are connected. Yep. Sure. It's just a? It's just an object. So this data is available any, anywhere in my view layer. So I can create another block here. And I will call it, I don't know, um, description in this case. I can create as many properties as I want. I will write a lorem ipsum inside. This is a big data object. And as soon as I go in my view layer, I can create a new element that I will call text in this case. And to access this data object, I use this super specific syntax, mustache syntax. So as long as I go inside here, basically what I'm saying here is go and find data for me. Find me data in this JS file. And what data do you want? I'm not going to write data dot. I just go straight and say, I want the description here. Give me my description. This description is actually this guy. I'm going inside data object and find me the description. And now send me this string and show it here. This is how they are connected. Is that clear? Yes, sir. This data, that's very key to, under, to understand. This data is a local data only for this page. There is more data that we call global data that will be available through the app. And there is also something we call caching. We can cache data. We can store data in the app that will be directly stored in the memory of your phone. This will be cache. The app data is pretty much, for example, here, they have stored some app data from the page. And I go in the new page. Now I have the app data, the local data. And you see I've got, I've got a tree of data. This is the debugging tool. And I see I have a header, a text, a description. I've got three stories and a count of zero. So that's another way to check your data. You go in the debugging tool here, add data, and you can find it. Each page has its own data object. Clear for this? OK, what's next? Design. We do a break in two minutes. Yeah? Before I move on to the APIs and whatnot, because there are way more things that this framework is giving you, of course. There are plenty of functionalities. First thing, last thing, sorry, I want to give you right now, 
is a bit of design practice. Um, WeChat have provided to you a library of CSS code so that you can replicate their own design, their own buttons, the green, the, you know they have their own design in, in their own apps. So if you go on their platform on weui.io, weui.io is listing all the CSS code and it's giving you some, let's say, reference on how to design the button. Remember, we designed it when we did components together. So this code, they have in their, see here, they have WeUI Wish in SS, and this is a library of code that you can inject into your page, into your mini program, I mean. You can download these guys. I think it's in the source folder here. And you can then load all their components. They have plenty of examples given to you. So if you look for a button, if you look for a grid, a gallery, they have already provided to you components, okay? And they come every time with some wishing uh, markup and some wishing design. Now, um, you can write any CSS code you want into your wishing files, your wishing SS files. And as I said earlier, remember, the app wishing SS is the one that is mastering all. So you, as long as you have a class here, it's available throughout the app. And then each page can have its own classes. So I recommend that you design the entire, I don't know, font size and you set the major class in this one to have the layout, I guess. And then each one will be customizations. Now, of course, you can import. That's why I give you this point. You can import some Weishin SS files if you want. So in this case, you could download the WeUI Weishin SS file. You put it inside your project somewhere. You create a new folder that you call style, I don't know. And then you can do add import to import another style sheet inside and load all the contents. Okay? The, the classic way. Import and then you can import any component or any file that you want. Now, last thing I give you about design. Um, Weishin has created a specific unit that is unique in this case. And of course you can use the pixels as always. But they also have created something they call responsive pixel. They designed it. And their practice, if I go in the documentation, their practice is to say, start by designing for the iPhone 6. And as soon as you design for the iPhone 6, use this sort of calculation. One responsive pixels is half a pixel. So if I want a font size of 20 pixels, I would need to write 40 responsive pixels. Just double it, right? A font size of 20 pixels will be 40 responsive pixels. So if you want to use this unit, you just double what you used to know. Now, why did they do this? Because they are actually going to modify the, the responsive pixels according to the size of the screen. If you have an iPhone 5 or an iPhone 6 or an iPhone 7, it's not pretty much the same screen size, right? So they're going to make it vary. This is the unit of reference. And the standard is to develop on iPhone 6. In my debugging tool here, I've got an iPhone 6. So I can select the different size. I can make the same app on iPhone 7. And you see the screen is going to be bigger. Or iPhone 5, and the screen is going to be smaller. So as long as you use their own responsive pixels, which here in this case means actually 100 pixels for, for us, but responsive pixel is 200, this padding will vary according to the size of the screen. So the padding will not be always the same. There is a tiny difference, and it's actually written in their, in their documentation. Here's the documentation. This file will be your best friend, by the way. This documentation is where you will find every single thing that happens in this framework. It's very detailed, it's full of good examples, and it's all in Chinese. <laughs> so, yeah, but then you, you do like me, you use a good translate if you want to, and boom, everything is given. So this is the conversion, the, the chart that they give us. 
they say that on iPhone 6, uh, one responsive pixel is half a pixel. And you will see that one responsive pixel is actually smaller on an iPhone 5. On an iPhone 5, one responsive pixel is a bit less than half a pixel. On the 6 Plus, it's a bit more. So they will make this pixel vary. That's how they make it responsive. They introduce these tactics. So up to you to see if you want to use it or not. Um, this is you to decide. We take a short break before I move on to uh, components and APIs. There's way more to come. We continue? <laughs> Do you have some brains? Let's go. Second part, um, two things, no, three things. Components, database, and APIs. So first, I will give you a small overview of the basic components given by the framework. You already know view, text, button, navigator. I want to explain how they work. There are a lot of components, actually. And there is a list that we provide to you. I mean, this is the link to the documentation. Now, this one is a good friend for you. And that's the navigator. It's like a link. And it works differently according to where do you want to link to. I want to show you different navigators. And we will show how we redirect to different pages according to what they are. Let me put this code, this component, the navigator, just like a link, inside the index page, this one. Um, and I want to link to the new tab, this one, new tab. And I want to link this one to the logs page. I have a logs page available, logs. Logs is this one, and also this one logs. So I'm inside my index page, and I'm adding three links inside, three A, three navigators. Every time I'm linking to something different. This one is, li is linking to the logs, this one is also linking to the logs, and this one is linking to the new page. So notice this pattern. When you want to do a link inside your mini program, you have to include all of this. You have to include the folder slash pages. OK, this is this guy, new. This is the name of your folder, and then the name of the page. You don't have to do dot uh, ml in here. This is useless. You just do new. This is the way you want to do the URL of your for your navigators. So they are here at the bottom. Let me just remove this user motto. I don't want it. And I've got different types of uh, links. It can be a redirection, or it can be a switch. So I'm sure you guessed that if I click on go to logs with the redirect type, I'm going to open a new page in my mini program. Well, if I do go to new page, I'm going to switch my tab from one to another. So there are some types of navigation. Um, if I click to logs, I've got a new page that is loaded directly on top of it. I've just reloaded entirely the page. If I click on the first one, hold on. Go to logs one. I'm going to open a new page on top of the previous one. That's key to understand. There are different ways to navigate. Either I have my index page here and I want to open a new page on top of it. So that's just a basic navigator to a page with a content. That's all. The default navigator opens a new page on top of the previous one. It was loaded on top, and I can always come back. And, and you see the page is going to hide and go to the right. This is what we call the stack. We can load different pages on top of each other. You can stack them on top of each other. So I can always navigate from one page that is below to a page that is on top of it. OK? That's the default navigator. And by the way, you can stack five pages on top of each other, maximum. If you do five times a navigator to a navigator to a navigator to a navigator, you'll be stuck. Your mini program will not allow you to go that deep. 
five maximum on top of each other. Now, this, this second navigator is a redirection. And basically, my entire app will be redirected to a different view. So you see, I even lost my tab bar at the bottom. And I don't have the back button. That's a redirection. You don't want to do that very often. I just want you to know that it exists. And the last one is the switch tab. This is an option. Uh, this is a property. So I can switch from, if I click new, I'm going to switch to the new tab. I can always come back here. And then this is the same. If I click this button, it's the same as if I click this one. I'm switching tabs. Cool for everybody? So that's a link with an absolute URL. Here. Cool for everyone, yeah? That was the first component. Uh, the button, oh, that's a nice one. The button will be useful for your forms. And it comes with a few properties. Well, form type submit doesn't make, it's not so important. But this property, loading, will display a little loading sign in here. This is built in. As soon as I have a button with a color, I think danger exists. Oh, no, danger does not exist. Bad luck. I don't know which one they use. Warner, warning, maybe? They have their own names for it. No, I don't remember. Um, so let's say that's one of the buttons. And then you can use loading in order to say, I want to show this little loader, yes or no. This may be very useful, because as, as soon as you click on a form, you want to tell your users, please wait. The data is processing. I'm going to send it to the database and, and come back to you in a second, right? Which doesn't work this way, apparently. So you can just include true inside this little property loading in order to modify this button. So in the course, the example we provide to you, we say that as soon as we submit the form, we bind the submit, we launch a function, remember the bind? We launch the bind form submit function, we fire it, and what do we do? We set the data, for what? For the loading here, this guy, which by default is false, and what are we doing here? We set it to true. Using this bang sign, we say I want the opposite. Do you remember the bang? saying I want the opposite of what you have. So when, whenever I click this, but this form, whenever I submit this form, I will change the loading from false to true. False will become the opposite, true. And where is loading? It's in the data object, and it goes right here. So basically what will happen is that every time I click this form, loading will become true, and then the loading sign will appear. This is data binding using the loading property here. Just a trick, but this one we display a little spinner. Yeah. I will go again to this flow. This is a button that is just showing you a little button you can click. This button belongs to a form. See, it's a submit button. And this button also has a little property that is named loading. Loading will help you to display a little spinner inside the, the button directly. So when I have uh, loading equal to, my button will show with a little loader. So you agree with me that I don't want this to show always. By default, I, I don't want this loading. I want to have this little spinner only when I click the button, I want then this spinner to appear. So how can I do this? I have to use a binding, just like we did earlier. And as soon as somebody hits this button, the form is submitted. So I can bind the submit. To what? To a function, bind form submit, that I named. This is my name. I name it bind form submit. So when I click this button, the form is submitted, the function is launched. This is the function. What is inside this function? To send an error, it is just a set data. 
this state data is going to change the loading property here, this one, from the data object. That's what is the save data for. This is to update the data object. So I'm going to update loading, which is by default false. That's why this button by default is not showing anything. When I set it to something different, I will actually make it the opposite of false, which is true. So loading becomes true. And loading is sent here. That's mustache syntax. What is this mustache syntax again? The data object right here. That's why by default this is false. It's written false in here. So you see the flow of this program? From the view layer to the logical layer. I click, I fire this function, I change the data, I make it true. So true is sent here and then the loading appears. Yeah, it will then, it, indeed, in that case, if I submit again, it will become false because that's the opposite of true. That's very true. That's a very little uh, trick and a little recap of how you bind data from the view layer to the logical layer. I gave this example because I was looking for a way to do it, and then I discovered that there is the loading, and then I'm like, yeah, that's very useful, but I don't want it always. I want it only when I click it. So how can you do it? Binding. Sweet. Next. <laughs> when I submit my form, I also want to tell my visitors, tell my users that, wait a bit, I'm processing your data. And for this, there is something we call a toast. We can show a little window directly on the page that we call, that we call a toast. So let me send you a toast in the page and you will see how it shows. I need this guy. This is my form. That is false by default. There will be no loading in there. I need this loading false in my data object. In here, data, I add false. And I need my function bind for submit. I do it fast, I'm just copying and pasting from the course. You guys can all do the same at the same time. I'm missing this one, here we go. So that's fine so, so far. Demo again, should, does it work? It should. When I click it, the loading appears. Perfect. Now next step, another component is named the toast. And this toast will show something right in the middle of my page. As soon as I submit my form, I want to show this toast. And there is this function built in called weishin.showToast. That will display a little toast for one second and a half with a title and a loading icon. So now this guy, this toast, is inside the submit function again. So it means that when I fire this button, I fire this event, and I click, and now I have this toast showing in my page, you see it? Bing. This is a toast. Could make it a bit longer for us to see it better. For three seconds and a half. So again, when I click this button, I submit my form and I have a toast appearing. I'm sure that you will be using this toast very often in order to load the page, for example. It's very common practice in many programs. Whenever you load a tab and you're waiting for the content, you will want to show a little toast to your visitor saying, content is being loaded, just wait. This is a toast. This guy. And I can write anything I want. Please wait, okay? And there are different icons. There is a success icon. I think it's called success, almost sure. Which is a little tick saying done. Let's have a look. Yeah, this is the success icon in the toast. Little tick. Cool. 
So this is your toast. You will want to use it. Um, okay, the switch button, I'm not going to cover it right now, but this is just a button that shows on and off. You can click it and it will toggle on. You can re-click it again, that will be off. So it's a switch and you can bind a change on it. As soon as I change this switch button, I can fire a new function. Let me just show you how it looks like so that everybody is clear about what is this component. A switch is like this. This is a switch button. Okay? So as soon as I click it, I have a bind change. I can create and I can do any function. So I could load a toast or write something as soon as I switch it. And check is by default in this one. So it shows this way. If I reload my page results check, you can imagine that the switch by default is not checked. By default is not checked. That would be the default state. And then I change it and I change it back and change again. Okay, that's a switch. That a bit more like this. And that's all I wanted you to know, at least for now. There are way more components, like these guys, like the buttons, and all of them have their own little properties to play with them. This is just to give you a little bit of an overview of the, the abilities that the framework gives you. <coughs> now, it's by default designed this way. I didn't even do any design. Right now it's all empty, all empty. And they show with the green and they show with this design by default. Thank you for asking. They are just like this by default. Of course you can design it your way. Sweet. Moving on. I need to introduce you to Link Cloud. Um, that's a choice. There are plenty of different ways to do the same. But when I was building this first mini program, I looked for a way to persist the data. I didn't want my data to stay only inside my app. I wanted to save the job offers and send it to a database so that everyone can access it, right? So how can I possibly send this data to a database? I have to do some network requests. Remember the get, the posts. I have to do some HTTP requests. And I looked for a very simple way to send data out and we see our post data and get data. So Link Cloud is one of many platforms that allows you to create a very simple database. It's free to use. Um, you can sign in with your GitHub account in two seconds. You sign up with GitHub and then you go inside you click GitHub button, you go inside, and then you have access to a dashboard with some applications. So as soon as somebody is sending us a job offer, it goes straight to this application, this Link Cloud application. And why did I choose uh, Link Cloud in particular? Because they have already built in a library that enables us to do the get, the post, very quickly with mini programs. So I'm able to download their package, their file, this mini program from Link Cloud package JavaScript file. And then I can initialize the Link Cloud database in my app. I'm just connecting my mini program to Link Cloud this way. And as soon as I do this, I have access to their own functionalities to do get and to do, to do posts. So I was using Link Cloud to store my data from my app to the cloud, if you wish. Link Cloud is also giving us a demo on their own uh, mini program that they did, of course, to show you the use cases. It's a it's called Link To Do. It's a to do to do list. So Link Cloud provided, and I think that was a, a a way for me to understand a bit better how to build mini programs. I went into this code, Link To Do, by Link Cloud. And I went through the code and I looked at the way they have designed their app and how do they connect their mini program to their database. So you see in the app.js file, they connect their mini program to Link Cloud directly with an app ID and app key. 
every single link cloud app has, and that will be the one we'll be using today, has an app ID and an app key. I can go into settings. Again, this is free to use. For a certain amount of data, it's free to use. So I've got the app ID and an app key. I can grab these, and then I'm be, I will be able to, to connect my mini program to my own app ID and own app key. And I can start to make some network requests. I can make some post and I can make some get. I will expect you today to go on LinkLearn, sign up for a free account, and as soon as you have an account, I can add you to a, a group. There is some sort of like groups of people, of users in, in LinkLearn. And this way, I will give you access to this database of job offers. Right? There is, right now, there are 35 job opportunities that were sent through our mini program. That's one thing I will do. Second, at the same time, I will give you access to this database that we use today. And all of you will be able to make your own mini program and connect it to this specific database. You will be using the same app ID and app uh, key, but you'll get access to this content. And your job will be to grab this data. I see you lost Louis already. Your, your job will be to grab this data and, of course, pull it to display it inside your mini program. So that will be a get. And, of course, next step, you will have to be able to post data from your mini program to link cloud. I'm not going to cover into details how to do it because there is a detailed tutorial that you will be following today to do it, to do, to do the connection. But the, the only thing you have to remember as of now is link cloud is here to store data online for free. B, you have to install this little JavaScript file in your project. You have to require it. And you have to initialize link cloud. As soon as you do this, you have access to link cloud inside your mini program. And when you, when you start to do this initialization, you do have access to some sort of queries, the same way that we were doing fetch. Here we can do a find, and then we can assign data. Just like we were doing a network request with fetch, URL, then response, then we get access to all the data we want. So in this example that they give it here, this is in the to-do's JavaScript file. They have an empty array of data. See, data object, empty array of, of to-do's. And on ready, so when the page is loaded, when the page is ready to, uh, to show, what do they do? They do a new query, like a SQL query, like uh, the query on the database, and they look for to-dos. This is the table name in LinkedIn in Cloud. They order them by descending, by when did they create this to-do. They use the find method to do what we call a promise, remember? And then, when we have the network uh, established and we get access to all the to-dos, they are going to set the data one after another. They are going to fill this array with all the to-dos that are in the base, in the database. So in, that would be, in our example, that would be this one. Today you will be fetching, finding, and storing everything that we have in this database. So that's one part. The second part is here. Um, no, this one is important. The dot save is the one that we do exactly the opposite. In here, you would make a new something and save it inside link cloud. The dot save is the opposite. That would be when you want to, to store something on link cloud. While the dot find is when you want to get something. Okay, that would be your get. This would be your post. So I'm, again, I'm not going to do it in the course right now. That would be a bit too, uh, too much work in, uh, in this lecture. But you will be uh, able to connect your mini program today using this tutorial. We, we wrote it in a really detailed way with examples so that you can do it step by step. Otherwise, your data will always stay only in your app and it won't be shared online. So that's why you want to do it this way. There is another way, a bit more advanced, but you have to know it exists. It's pretty much the good old fetch that they call wishing requests. 
A reaching request is exactly like a fetch in JavaScript, where you, send, you say where to, who do you want to fetch with, so what is the URL of your HTTP request, what do you want to send, if it's a post, you want to send some data, what is the method, it can be a get, it can be a post, it can be a delete, and what happens when you have successfully sent the data? That would be the waiting request. So we can do HTTP request, like this, to a certain server, maybe our own server, to our own app, send data to the app, and then log the success. This is the machine request, and this is your fetch. This is the good old way. Now, notice something. It's important to know that this request will work only in China. You cannot do a fetch, a post, uh, whatever you want, a, a wishing request to a server that is outside of China. Because this wishing request must connect to a server that has an ICP license, which means only in China. You remember what is the ICP license? It's a license that only Chinese companies can have in order to hold some code in China. If you want a server in China and have your source code hosted in China, you need to apply for a license. It's very easy to do, but it's only for China. So if you want to do a waiting request, if you want to connect your mini program to your server, this must be a server in China that has an ICP license. Otherwise, the network request will be blocked. It will not go through. Tencent will not allow you to do a HTTP request to a server that is outside, at least for the production. You can always develop it, and you can try with a server that is in the US. You can do some requests in this ID, it's fine. But on the production, on live, on your, for your users, it will not work. The request will not, will not function. You must be only in China. Second thing, and last thing, for this network thing, we have to whitelist. I don't know if you're familiar with the whitelist ID, but we have to authorize this mini program to connect to specific servers. Otherwise, the mini program will not do the HTTP request. So by default, in the app that we gave you, with this app ID, we already have whitelisted link cloud servers. You see, these are HTTP requests. And we authorize this app to connect to these servers. We can add what are the servers that we want and authorize them. This way, we know that we can do HTTP requests. So that's security. You need to configure your mini program to connect to ser some servers. And these servers must be in China. All right? So again, that, that's, that's the reason I wanted to go fast and use LinkCloud. I knew that they gave me already a, some sort of functionalities already provided. I can find, save anything I want. I know that their servers in China, it's free to use. So I was like, okay, let's not create a server and run all the code. I will use, just use LinkCloud to store this data. It's quite simple this way. That's again the reason today I want you to try using it because that's a quite classic way to develop a prototype in China. You want to use a small database, at least for the beginnings, and then you play with it quickly. But know that the basic way to do it is wishing request, like a fetch. OK? Any questions? You seem so scared right now. It's not more complex than uh, before. So same thing than before. Last thing, some functionalities given by the framework. There are a lot, and they're all listed in the documentation. I will show you just the ones that I like, so that you know a little bit what the app can do. It can do a lot, actually. All of them are listed in, in the official documentation in the API tab here. I will put it in English for those who need. And here we go. Thank you, Google. So I have the network, the management of the pictures. No, not in French, sorry. English. The, the management of all the pictures, the management of files. I can transfer files from many programs. The management of data, local storage. This is caching can store data directly in your phone. I think it's up to 20 megabytes of data in a mini program. I can 
find your location. Where are you on the GP on the map? So that would be some sort of GPS coordinates. I can open a map, of course. I can find what phone are you using. Get all the system of your phone. So anything, any information. What kind of network do you have? What, how are you using the accelerometer accelerometer of your phone? You know what is this? The accelerometer. When you move your phone, your phone is able to know what what are you doing? How are you moving it? You can calculate exactly what kind of movements you're doing. This is the accelerometer. And the mini program has access to it. You can grab the position of the phones. I can use the compass. I know the compass is north, south, uh, east, west. The accelerometer is the movements you're doing. So when I move my phone this way, I'm using the accelerometer. When, when I turn this way, I'm moving the direction with the compass. And then I know that the north, I don't know where is the north actually, more or less this way, I guess. Um, and so I will be able to know what is the, where is my uh, user to. I can make some phone calls. can immediately trigger the phone. So I can press a button and the phone function from the phone will, uh, will launch. I can make my user scan the QR code. I can launch the QR code scanner directly from the mini program. I can activate all the Bluetooth parts of the phone, uh, change the brightness of the phone, make the phone vibrate. There are plenty of APIs available, and they're all working exactly the same way. If you understood one API, then they're always the same. So I'll show you at this one. Interface, what is this? Uh, the toast I shared to you earlier. This is how to give a little bit of feedback to users. Loading, navigation bar, uh, how to navigate from pages to pages. I can make some drawings. I don't want this too, too early. I can log in my user to grab its personal information. So I will be able to get access to your picture, to your nickname, to your gender, to your city. So I can ask, and this is what you do when you open for the first time this app. Here I already have the login done because I have access to my profile picture and my nickname. So they have done for us, for free, they have done here a Weshin Get User Info. You see it in the ID, Weshin Get User Info. This is one of many APIs provided by the, by the framework. Okay? And that would be very useful in order to make some social apps. And then I can manipulate all the data and, and do some analytics with it. Okay? So that's a lot of APIs, and they keep adding new ones. This documentation evolves every week. There are new functionalities almost every week. That's why I told you in the introduction that I feel that more or less right now you can do 80% of what a native app can do. It's quite outstanding um, how much information you have access to. Sweet. Let's move to some important ones. You remember the geocoder? It's a bit faster to do with Tencent. I can use this button to bind tap it. So whenever I click this button, I will launch a function. I name it my way, listener, btn, get location, blah, blah, blah. And then inside, this is an API. I'm using get location, which will ask Tencent to locate my user. And immediately after, when I successfully get the location, there is a callback function here, success. Whenever I successfully get the location from Weishin, then I get access to all the results. Uh, yes, here in this example is result. And part of the results is the latitude and longitude of my user. I also get access to the speed. I don't know exactly what it means, but we can uh, give it a try. So I will add a new function here name, I will remove this guy, btn get location. And this function is here to launch get location, Weishin get location. Now I need a button in my page. This button will launch the function btn get location. And as soon as I click get location, what happens? 
I ask Tencent to give me the location. Forget about this, there are different types, but this one is the one you want to use. And as soon as I successfully get the location, I'm going to grab the latitude, the longitude, the speed, the accuracy, and I can log them one by one. I can log the latitude. I can log the longitude. Now, of course, if, if I log it, it means I can also add it to the data object. I can always set the data and modify it. Longitude. Actually, let me do it. Latitude, by default, nothing. Longitude, by default, nothing. Now, as soon as I get the location, I will want to change the data. And I want the latitude, this one, to grab this variable, latitude. Yeah? I think I can do it twice. I'll try again. Longitude to become the longitude. This one refers to this one. Longitude. Longitude. This one is here. And we add this one. This is the latitude. And I will also add in here. The longitude. So by default, nothing will show. And as soon as I click my button, get location, I'm going to grab my location. And of course, it doesn't work. That's beautiful. Ah, here it is. And I've got a problem with my save data, of course. Classic. Anyway, here's my latitude, here's my longitude. So you see, I'm asking Weixin when I click this button over the network, and it takes a little bit of time. I'm asking Weixin to grab my location. I receive a big object with a lot of information, and I log my latitude and my longitude right here. That's just one among many of the examples. Uh, forget about this. Do it this way. That is the page. This is what we did yesterday. Self equal this, doesn't matter. So now, again, requests over the network, get my location, boom. Now it shows here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As of now, it's going to use the data of my computer. So as long, and that's, that's it. thank you for asking. Actually, my location right now is in Australia okay. because I've got a VPN on. So this happened to me a few times. I was, I was working on, on the mini program and I was connected in Hong Kong and I couldn't figure out why my map was always showing in Hong Kong. And I was like, what's going on with my location? And I couldn't figure out why. And it took me a while to understand, OK, I've got the VPN on. So it is indeed the environment of this ID. Now, if I want to test it on my phone, I can always go in the last tab here and launch a test. This one will compile the app. It will give me this QR code. And if you scan it with your phone, because you guys are programmers right now, you, are, you have access to this app, you have access to the demo. So if you scan this QR code, you will see the app, and you should have your you should have what I have in the ID too, but directly inside a, a mini program. Is it working? Yeah. So it should be your own face, and if you click get location, it should be the location of your phone, not in Australia. Anymore. So that's the way I will uh, test my mini program from time to time. The ID is just one step, and the next step is to test it directly with, uh, on on your phone. So again, the process is, I've got the button, I bind tap on this button, and as soon as I click this button, I fire this waiting gate location that is giving me a success callback. I, I also have a fail callback, by the way. If something fails, I can always do something. As of now, for simplicity, I only have the success callback, but then I get access to all the data, 
inside the results from Weishin, and I can log it, of course, and then I can store it in variables, and then I can assign it to the data object to show it in the page. This is the, the full process uh, of this app. Right now. Okay for you? This is a way simpler one than anything else for geocoding. It's just locating your users. Now, another small API. If you want to activate this forward button in your mini program, I'm sure you will because you won't be able to share it. Or if you want to create a button like share to your friends directly in your markup, there are a few um, very simple functions. This one, unshare message, will enable the forward button. Unshare message is already built in. It is this one. It's given to you for free. Unshare message. And as soon as you have this guy, you have access to the forward button. So I can manipulate directly what do I want it to write. I want you to return this. So when somebody is sharing my app, it will be directly a link to this index page. Normally here, when I click this button, I should be able to share it. Doesn't work, of course. Ah, in the new page, sorry. New. Hello, Donna. So when I click this share button here, ah, okay, here it is. Now I have the share. So this on share app message is now available in here. And I click this guy. I got this title, which is this one. And the pass is going straight to my index page. OK? That's how you activate the share. It's created by the framework. And that's how you make the button. I'm not going to cover it. This is this button here. It's quite simple. Cool? Um, there is, I'm not going to do the, the code itself, but there is a cache functionality. So you guys know that we have local storage in data in here. This is the app data. This is the page data here, index. There is the app data in here. We can access this data from the debugging tool, app data. I get access to a tree of data from the index page, from the new page. This is local storage. I can do more than that. I can cache some data and save it in your phone. Why? Because I will want you to save information in the memory of your phone. So next time I come back on the mini program, the information is always here. It's loading faster, and it's already saved. Any settings that your users are doing, for example. If you want to configure the mini program, you want to save this environment. So you can do local storage. And this is like a cookie on your, on your desktop. Yeah? In this case, it is local storage, some local caching. There are two functions to use. One is named Weishin Set Storage. Weishin Set Storage will store something. That's one side. And the opposite one is Weishin Get Storage. This one will open your cache, look for a specific key, and get you access to it. This is how you get access to your cache, get storage. And I think, as of now, that it's 20 megabytes of data that you can store directly on your user's mobile phone, inside WeChat app, basically. You won't have to do it right now, but you need to know that caching exists. This way, you can store permanent information in your users. OK? Now, last thing. You will want to use uh, this wiki that we make. We made it for you, clearly, um, so that you have a lot more information, even in English, for events, for components, like how to make a map, for example. If you guys want to make any map, it's fairly simple to do. There is a map component. And use this wiki as much as you can today, because there are many things that are scattered online and, in, and the documentation is a bit heavy. This one is lighter. So, your assignment today, and I hope you will like it, um, it's, hold on, I'm trying to find the address, here we go. We are going to design a little mini program that is called Fuck My Life. Do you guys know this website? 
it's very old. Basically, this is a this is a website where mostly teenagers used to share their everyday life stories of something bad or very embarrassing that happened in their day. So they used to share things that happened and some prank that they received or anything like. So this is really teenager style. You can see. Uh, ah, I don't want to read this. <laughs> so <laughs> that was a bad one. So. It was something happening in the shower. So, um, Fuck My Life um, used to be a big hit for teenagers and they would share their everyday uh, life stories, something embarrassing that happened, and everybody would say, yes, your life sucks. And they would vote it saying this one is really, really, really embarrassing, right? So everybody can share their, their bad stories and everybody has bad days, right? So in this mini program, I will ask you guys to design and this is a GIF to show you a bit the, what we expect. We will ask you guys to create a small mini program called FML for Fuck My Life. And you will be able to, on one tab, list stories. So here are some stories that are listed. Story 1, Story 2. And we can upvote the stories. When we feel that the story is very terrible, so I can list the stories here, I will browse them. I've got stories to read. And if I want, I can submit a new Fuck My Life because something bad happened to me today. So my name will be shown here. I will put some data, send it, submit it. Obviously, send it to Link Cloud, which holds the Fuck My Life stories, and list it back to the to the homepage here. Ready?